Turn to song number 137. Song 137, we will sing Christ the Lord is risen today. Song 137. Let's all rise to our feet as we lift our voices in praise to the Lord this morning. Song 137. Let us sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of man and angels say, Alleluia. Praise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Oh, 
This great mission he engaged upon, this thing he did to bring salvation in the world is because he loved you and he loved me. And so here we are. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. At this time, I want you to know as we lift our prayer and lift our hearts to our God in heaven, I want you to know that he hears us and he brings his ear low to hear our prayer because he is gracious and because he loves us. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your kindness and your great love. Lord, before we even knew our own names, you loved us and you sent your son to give his life for us. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning where we can come and lift up your name and lift our hearts toward you. We're asking this morning that you would bless us and that you would be near to us, that you would manifest yourself, show yourself as a way to comfort our hearts so that we know that you're near and that you're with us. And Lord, we're asking for your power, your blessing, speak to us through your word. Bless the worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this time, we will have announcements. And I'll ask you to be seated at this time. Brother Ocasio, if you would please. I do have some of these announcements listed here Good. on our service order. Um, if you don't mind, I will talk about this. Yes. And you, you've got the rest. Okay. Amen. <laughs> well, let's be... For well, one second here, very patriotic. What are we celebrating tomorrow? Memorial Day. And these are people in uniform, people that served this country. Many never came back. Some did come back. Some came back wounded. Some people came back wounded. But more importantly, how we have these freedoms in America. You know, we take for granted, you know. COVID-19, uh, China, Korea, the border, everything. But let's be aware that this country was founded by blood, guts, sweat, and tears. And there are people. Now, I'm going to try my best with my brothers to go to the cemetery in Calverton and pay homage to my father. He's buried there. He served in World War II in the Korean War. And my uncle also served in World War II. They're all gone. They've been long gone already. And uh, I, I just want to be uh, sensitive that there are many people that have had loved ones uh, that have served this country well and then have given the ultimate sacrifice. And even now, there's been a couple of deaths and a couple of things happening in Afghanistan and other areas, you know. The enemy of America never stops. So. Uh, Set aside all your differences, political beliefs, whatever you have, and God gave this country, it's a Judeo-Christian country, but more important, there are people that have fought and died 
to keep America free. To come to church or to stay home. And there are people that are very unpatriotic. They'll even burn the flag, but we fought and died so they can have that right to do it, even though I don't agree with it. But nevertheless, America is a beautiful and a wonderful country with problems, with problems. But let us be mindful there are many people that have died. So people forget, you know, what, the, what we're celebrating here and all these old veterans and the American way of life. We're slowly losing it. We're slowly losing it. So let's us, while we're here at Family Baptist Church, we give honor where honor is due. Now here, there's one thing, so let me just come on with some of the announcements that we have. Uh, Pastor, if I can find out, tomorrow's schedule, we have, they were scheduled for a Memorial Day event tomorrow. Are it's we, still on. It's still on? The weather's going to be nice. The weather's going to be better. So normally, it, we meet right there by uh, Parkside and um, near the circle, the place that we always... Uh, Make that this time uh, you bring what you want to bring. Uh, we're gonna have some. We have tables there. We're gonna have basic snacks and everything like that. So uh, you're welcome to come if the weather will permit for a lot of you. And again, I saw the news. It's gonna be around in the 60s. So if you could make it there for a little bit, please come by, share. You know we've been having this tradition now for some time now. And we didn't have it last year, am I correct, Pastor? We did. Oh, we did. Yes, we, had, we did. Oh, no, no, you're right. We, we did not. We had the 4th of July? Because uh, we had 4th of July. Oh, we had 4th of July. But we did not have We didn't have the Memorial Day last That's year. We were barely it was, yeah. coming out yes. of the pandemic. Well, okay, anyway, let me just get uh, that Pastor's going to talk about one of the announcers of Sight and Sound. And, uh, no, you still Sight and Sound. Hmm? Sight and Sound. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do we do that arrangement with Second Town? Still working on it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, those that have any monies that want to give, please um, make sure that we get it because we have to. We have to acquire all the tickets now, uh, or at least the tickets that we feel that are those that are going to attend, and those that are watching us that didn't come today, uh, please bring your money in for Sight and Sound. It's June 23rd, but we need to pay in advance, too, on that. Uh, June 13th, Sunday, we're going to have baptism, believers' baptism. So if you have anybody that's named the name of Christ that have not been baptized, please let us know. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have baptism here. Am I correct, downstairs? Yes, sir. Beautiful. They have a baptistry downstairs. You know downstairs can hold almost 200 people. That's pretty big. And this room here is, just to give you a perspective, this is 1,500 square feet, like that, you know, that's sad. So the church that we're trying to get, just the basement alone is 9,000 square feet. So you know how big it is. And then the third, second floor is 6,000 square feet. Remember, this is 1,500 square feet. So pray for us. And then the main auditorium is 9,000 square feet and holds about, total, about 400, 500 people. So... If we get it, it's because God's hand's involved in it. That's all I would tell you. So we don't want to talk too much about it, but we know that we have to get serious about our building fund. And we're waiting for some responses right now, so uh, we're in the millions. We're in the millions. So if anybody does this uh, on their own accord, we welcome it. But usually, a situation like this has to come from God because we do not have the wherewithal. Right now, right today, right now, to say, hey, we're going to buy that $5 million, $4 million property. So there are things that are moving. So keep praying. I know we're coming out of COVID-19. I know a lot of people have a lot of things on their mind. But we are looking for a permanent location. And we're looking for God's hand to, to create opportunities for us and a miracle here. So long as we stay faithful, so long as pastor stays on the straight and narrow, uh, God blesses the pastor. And then through the pastor, we get blessed. Amen. That's how it works. He doesn't bless the church. You've got to bless the man of God first to guide the church. And that's exactly what we have. The scriptures of the week over here, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll read some of it. It says, Hebrews 4, verse 12 to 16. For the word of God is quick. I like when he says that. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even 
to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me stop there. The, the, the word you have in your hand, the Bible, is sharper than any sword that ever created by man. Because as you're, as you're putting that down and you're laying the word of God, you have to point back to you. It comes right back. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in the sight, but all things are naked, are naked and open. I saw the type of the, uh, apron, uh, are naked and open unto the eyes of him for whom we have to do. Seeing that we have a great and high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Listen, there is no power greater than that of Jesus Christ. And that is what we follow, that is our precepts to follow the, the commandments of God as best as we can. We'll always be sinner, but Jesus never sinned. Never sinned. So with that, I just want to let you know that Pastor, as he said, echoing what he says, that you are loved, and God loves you. He loves me. He loves us all. The greatest of all power is love, is charity. So remember, there are people out there that are, uh, that, are, that are not saved, and there are people that you can make a difference in school. Now we're going to be coming back to normal a little bit. A lot of vaccines are out there. But listen, we have to get back to the business of God and getting souls to the kingdom of God. Okay, there are a lot of people, they have to stop using COVID-19 as an excuse not to come to church. Okay, you can, occasionally the weather, but, you know, you should be here in church now. There's no more excuses with COVID-19, you know. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor. And, uh, folks, let's be mindful. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, it's Memorial Day. And that's what it is. Pastor, Amen. thank you for Brother. giving me the opportunity. Again. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I want to, I, I just have one more thing to share with you. Um, uh, many of you prayed for uh, Mr. Alan Forbes. And of course, he passed away uh, some days now ago. And uh, his daughter, Tatiana, who was with us some weeks ago, he uh, asked the church to pray. Uh, they're going to have the funeral next Friday on June the 4th. They have the funeral on Friday, June the 4th. I do not have the address at this time of the funeral home where they're having uh, the, the proceedings. If you are interested in coming uh, for the viewing and the funeral, uh, please let me know. I will find out very quickly where it is. Uh, it's going to be in the evening time at about 5 o'clock. I believe 5 to 6.30 is the viewing, and 6.30 to 8 will be uh, the funeral service. And um, so it was just about a, a day or two. Actually, just yesterday, uh, it's confirmed that I will be bringing uh, the message for the funeral. He asked earnestly that the church would pray so that many people will get saved in the funeral. And uh, she told me that they'll have family and friends coming from the EU, from Canada, from Barbados, and other places. And so she, uh, I can tell you she'll be very appreciative. And they'll be in an excess of 200 people there. So just uh, as sad as the situation is, it's also an incredible opportunity. So I'm asking for you to pray as well, that God would bless me as I bring a message there, and I'm, I've done it quite uh, many times in funerals, giving the gospel, and so uh, many times I'm not, I don't have an opportunity to let the church know that that's happening, and uh, this time I know in advance, and I can ask you to pray, and she's asking for those prayers too, very important, very important, there's nothing more important than souls coming to the kingdom. Uh, yesterday we were out soul winning, 
And uh, Madeline and I teamed up again yesterday, and we had the wonderful privilege of having five people pray the sinner's prayer with us. It was quite a, a special day yesterday. And so the, the work continues on. Amen? And um, at this time, we don't have a, a steady soul winning meeting place yet, but uh, please be in prayer for these things. Our Father in heaven knows that we have need of them. Amen? And so we're going to continue the service, and we're going to sing. Let me ask you to all stand once again. We will sing the Solid Rock, Psalm 272. The Solid Rock, Psalm 272. Let's all stand to our feet as we lift our voices. Psalm 272. Let us sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. is to receive us for and since 
said, hey, I played the guitar. And I said, really? You're going to play in church. You're going to offer your gift to the Lord. And so uh, we have others here with good voices. Amen? And we, as we use our gifts for the Lord, God blesses his church. Amen? And uh, praise the Lord. By the way, in reference to that song, I've always loved that song, Give Thanks. I remember the first time I ever heard it was when I was a student at Howes Harrison College, and I heard the First Baptist Church of Hammond Choir sing that song as an opener, and it always touched my heart as a student hearing that song, and now let the weak say I am strong. You know, it says in Isaiah chapter 40, it says this, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no strength, he increaseth strength, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. And we are in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We will be reading verses 25 through 33. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, so I hope you found it by now. Amen? Let me ask you to all stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. I will read uh, verse 25. You'll join me, of course, on verse 26. The Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field... Which, is, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? 
O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, what, we sh what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me ask, uh, since this is time for scripture reading, I see some young people sitting, and you need to stand out of respect. In God's house, no one's excluded unless you have some type of severe physical ailment. All right? This is a church where everybody participates. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And ask God's blessing on the message. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've given and your kindness, Lord God. Thank you for the institution of prayer. What a gift it is. What an amazing expression of your grace, Lord God. What an amazing situation that we find furnished by your grace that you should count us your sons and your daughters because of your son, Jesus Christ. You've received us in adoption. Lord God, thank you. And may we ever and always understand our position. And may we learn about prayer this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. I just want you to know before we get started, uh, your pastor is not going to let you slack off in church. OK, uh, we, uh, understand this. I understand it well, and I need you to understand it with me. We are a team and we are together so that everyone young and small, uh, great and small, young and old, everyone needs to know that you are important to God. And we need your faith in this place. Amen. We can't afford to have the whole church on the same page, praying, serving God, all, all kinds of dedicated, but we have one that is doing their own thing on their own program. We can't afford to lose the one. All right? And so that means the young people, we need you. Amen? Now, let's get right to business this morning with the preaching, I have quite a message to give to you. And if you are not paying attention, you are going to miss out. And I'm going to tell you right now, we can't afford to have you miss out. Listen, if you were here last week, we know that every member of the body is important. So if you think you're a pinky toe and you're not important, you're mistaken. Every part of the body has a purpose and has great importance. And so we're going to treat you so. Amen. Now, it is my great honor and delight to stand before you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Yes, I know it's raining. And it is a beautiful Sunday morning. Listen, my car is dirty. And the rain is just kind of good. <laughs> I need to clean my car. But, you know, with the things that get on the car, sometimes the rain washes it off. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 118, verse 24, This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. With the rain or the sun, whatever the circumstances may hold, I want you to know that the farmers are thrilled for the rain, we need rain, amen? With full recognition of what we have in blessings, we lift our hearts to the Lord and we give thanks to him. Please, everyone, mentally engaged. I'm going to try to watch you to make sure you're not looking at your phones, okay? I'm going to try to keep you honest this morning, but you should keep yourself honest without my help. Nevertheless, we give thanks to God. We thank him. We thank him for his word. We thank him for salvation. We thank him for another sunrise, another day. 
Now, for today's message, the Lord has heavily impressed upon me an idea that is kind of difficult for me to explain to you. And it may be for you difficult to understand. So we cannot, pay attention, we cannot wander off mentally. All right? I'm going to try to get this to you. Now, here we go. We all want to learn how to pray better. We all want to get more answers to our prayers. Anybody on that, on that same page with me? Want to get answers to your prayer? Want to know how to pray better? Anyone? Everyone's hand should be raised, but it's all right. Okay, half of you are sleeping. All right, I understand. It's early. Now, we know that our God hears and answers prayer. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God hears us. He answers prayer. If we ask things according to his will, God will open the windows of heaven and grant to us the request of our petition. He will answer our prayer in the affirmative. It also says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Listen to me. Those people who have shaken their fist in God's face, God does not answer their prayers. But those of us who are trying to live right and do right, God's ears are open to our prayers and he answers our prayers. Our God is a gracious God. He is loving. He is our heavenly father. And he listens to the cries of his children. That's you. And that is me. We know this. When I say that God answers prayer, the spirit that is within us kind of nods. I've said that to Christian people in the past and in other messages. So I know how you're going to react when I say God answers prayer and God's people respond in the affirmative. Amen. Praise the Lord. He answers prayer. While at the same time, I know this, that in our experience, there's, we have prayers that we feel have not been answered. We have prayers that we're not sure why we haven't seen change in a particular area. And that's what I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about this morning. Our spirit, the spirit that's within us, agrees in the affirmative, says yes. Yes, God hears and answers prayer because it's true. However, in our experience, we pray and we feel something is wrong. Something's not right. I prayed about this thing, but I didn't see a change or an answer in the way I requested it. I find a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers, I dare say the majority of them, elders, they know what I am talking about and they don't have answers why this is. They don't have an ability to explain this contradiction. We know God answers prayer, but I can't exactly tell you why I didn't get an answer to prayer on this thing or that thing or the other. And so let's get right into this this morning. Jesus is giving us his famous sermon here in Matthew chapter 6. It really started in Matthew 5 and it continues to Matthew 6. And seven, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' most famous sermon. And in the sermon, he tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, not to uh, pray like the heathen do with vain repetition. Let's read the verse. It says this, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. And when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard 
for their much speaking. So you've got people, the Bible calls heathens, Jesus is speaking. He says they're heathens and they are praying, 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 but they're using what the scripture is calling vain repetitions. And these people think that God is hearing them because they're talking a lot to God. But they're using vain repetitions. Now, I have learned this. When I hear people teaching the Bible, yes, thank you. Pen, you need to look up here. Get off your phone. Put the phone away if you have to. Okay? Put it away. All right? Listen. Now, if you uh, look at uh, vain repetitions, and I've heard this in church, when teachers talk about vain repetitions, they, they talk about the Catholic Church. And they talk about, oh, it's the vain repetitions. That's just saying the Our Father. Uh, that's just saying those Hail Marys, those vain repetitions. That's what they call vain repetitions. But guess what? This scripture, these words that Jesus is uttering, pre-existed the Our Father. As a matter of fact, he gives the Our Father right here. The Lord's Prayer. And then also, he uh, the, the Hail Mary, the Hail Mary prayer didn't exist yet. So when Jesus says these words, he's not talking about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church didn't exist yet. So what are the vain repetitions? It says here, as the heathen do. So here are my two questions for you this morning, for you to think. Now you are thinking this morning, aren't you? You are awake, aren't you? All right, let's check. Let's see if you have, you have a pulse. Are you alive? Okay. All right, you're there. Listen. Ready? Two questions. Who are the heathen? Question number one. Question number two. What are the vain repetitions? I just told you they are not the Catholic prayers. I was taught that by people, Bible teachers, is referencing Catholic prayers, but Catholic prayers didn't exist yet. So what's Jesus talking about? Those are the two questions we'll explain shortly. All right? Vain repetitions and the heathen. What are they? Now, it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, the next verse, it explains what the vain repetitions are. Our answer is coming. Who wants to have an answer? Who wants to pray right? Raise your hand. Just make sure you're awake. Okay. This is the pastor checking on you. I want to see your eyeballs, eyes. And when people are talking to you, when I was a little boy, my older brother would say, look at me when I'm talking to you. Okay? And I'd be looking the other way. And he said, look at me when I'm talking to you. So the preacher, I'm speaking to you. I get my eyes down here on my nose. And I look up, communicate with you. Because I'm not talking to the pulpit. This is not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you out there. Amen? All right? So if I'm talking to you, if you're listening to me, I want to see your eyes. If I don't see your eyes, you're looking somewhere else. Your attention is diverted. All right? You're only to look down when I say... Look at your verse. Then you look down and you look at the scripture. Okay? Now, pay attention. Everyone listen. All right? Just, all right. Now, continuing. Verse number eight. Matthew chapter six. Here's what it says. It says here, Be not ye therefore like unto them. Who's them? Anybody paying attention well enough knows the answer? Who's them? Heathen. Verse 7 again. Pay attention. Here we go. But when you pray, verse 7 here. But when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think they, they shall be uh, heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them. Them is the heathen. Don't be like them. Don't do like them. Okay, who's them? The heathen. Who are they? I'll tell you in a minute. It says they are using vain repetitions. They do much speaking. So they're trying to pray, but they're not getting much work done. Verse number eight. Jesus says it's much speaking. Much of our prayers is just that. We're talking to God. We're trying to pray but we're not praying the right way. Now, telling God to do things that he is already going to do 
might be not very productive, might not be the best way to pray. Let's read verse number eight. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Amen. Now listen. Ready? Eyes. I don't see your eyes. Thank you. That's how the only way I know you're listening, when I see your eyes. Because I can't see your ears like that. I can't see what you hear, but I see what you're looking at. Now, much speaking references things that our Father in heaven knows that we have need of. It says here in verse 8, again, knowing what things ye have need of before ye ask him. The Bible says in Luke 12, how Luke chapter 12, how God knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He knows you inside and out and very intimately. And I want you to know this also. He knows already what you need before you pray. Before you close your eyes and say, dear father in heaven, and you start to lay upon the Lord your request and what you need, God already knows what you need before you ask him. So now, the vain repetitions, what are they? They are things that we bring to God, that we ask for, that God already knows what we need. Do you understand that? Are you seeing that? With me, let's go back to the scripture that we looked at earlier when we got this thing started. It says in verse number 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Again, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. It says, take no thought. What's thought? Thinking. Your brain. Do not think about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about whether or not you will have food. Do not worry whether or not you will have something to drink. Don't worry about whether or not you will have clothes. Your Father in heaven knows that you have need of these things. And here's the... Here's the thing, the popular teaching is not the vain repetitions being the daily needs. What I'm trying to say is here we are, we start praying to God, oh Father, please provide food for us. Our Father in heaven says, I got that already, I know already, dear Father, please give me the things I need for my survival. Your Father in heaven is like, why are you wasting my time with that? I've already got that for you. Dear Father in heaven, listen to me. A, a child, we have young people today. We do not have children in this room, I suppose, that go to mommy and daddy and say, mommy and daddy, can you please provide for me uh, a place to sleep tonight? I'm like, baby, you, you slept here last night. You've been sleeping here all your life. What are you talking about? Mommy and daddy, and so on. That you, you as a child, do, you do not go to your parents asking for things that are already provided for you. They're kind of, oh, dare I say, taken for granted. But however, we go to our Heavenly Father and we ask Him for things that He already knows that we have need of before we ask Him. And so we're just getting started this morning. Just getting started now. Telling God to do things that he's already going to do is doubting God's design, God's desire to provide for us. We don't need to doubt that he's going to provide. And now we continue. Then again, this blessed idea, yet curious, is expressed in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 31 and 32. Let's look at 31 and 32. It says here, Therefore take no thought for your life, saying, What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles 
seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Is that not the second time I just read that? Our Father in heaven knows that we have need of these things. Verse 32. Follow me back to verse 8 again. Your Father knoweth that ye what things ye have need of before you ask him. Two times it says this idea. And now in verse 32 it says again. Um, it says, for after these things do the Gentiles seek. Gentiles. There it is. Remember the heathen? Who are the heathen? The Gentiles. Those who do not know God. They don't know God as their father. And they seek after these things. The same things that God already knows we have need of. If we are going to pray on and on over basic needs that God is already well aware of, that we need, Jesus tells us in verse number 30 that our faith is small. We, we call him our heavenly father, but we don't treat him as a father. We treat him more as a stranger who we have to beg and come to and try to pry out of God blessing to give to us. When God's heart is open wide and God desires to open to us the windows of heaven and to bless us and to give us, we start to pray, oh God, and we ask for things with a feeling of our heart that God doesn't want to give it to you. When in fact, that is not the case at all. The heart of God is toward you. Even the Lord Jesus said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There is nothing out there that exists that God does not want you to have. I think of a wealthy father. Uh, who wishes their dad was rich? Amen. <laughs> who has a rich father? My father in heaven's rich. Amen. If you look at a wealthy family, a rich family, what is it that those children do not have. There's nothing. I mean, can, you know, when, when your birthday comes around, you get a gift and your parents bless you and we love our birthdays. Can you imagine what their birthday gifts look like? It's your birthday and, and, and dad's rich. And so uh, what, for your birthday, you might get a horse. <laughs> a horse in a stable. Here, and, and equestrian lessons. Look, to learn how to ride the horse. That's what, for your birthday, as a teenager, you get a sports car. Dad's rich. But why, why is that? Well, because that dad has the resources. He has the money, and he can buy whatever he wants for his children. So he goes out there and gets the best that he can for his children. Well, how do you think that your father in heaven doesn't have the same heart toward us? He wants to give us and does give us his best. He gives to us his best. But for some reason in this world, Christian people who have already received the greatest gift that ever was given, ever was thought of, it was given by God, it was Jesus Christ. And we think that God does not want to give to us when he gave to us the greatest thing, his own son, that was ever given. What does it say in Romans chapter 8, verse 32? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Listen to me, if there's anything in this life that you do not have, that you think that you need or you want, understand that it is not because God doesn't want to give it to you. It's only because God knows it's not good for you. And your Father in heaven wants the best for you. Because believe me, if, if it was about having a bigger house, 
Believe me, your father in heaven wants you to have that big house. Is it about having a car? Oh, you think God is so cheap that he doesn't want to give you a car? He just knows that you'll find a way to wrap it around a telephone pole somewhere. So he doesn't give you the car. Because he knows you're going to misuse the car. So he doesn't give you the car. But understand this. If you can handle it, God would give it to you. If it was good for you and that's what you needed, you better understand. God would make sure you have it. Because your father in heaven gave up the hardest thing that he could ever give up. He gave up his own son so that we could have eternal life because there was nothing that we needed more than the blood of Jesus Christ so that we could be saved and born again. That was the greatest need that we had. And understand this, if God can give up his son, there is nothing that he's willing to withhold from you. He wants you to have everything. It's just that you can't handle everything. So he doesn't give you everything. Your father in heaven loves you. He loves you. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If you can handle it, not all of us can handle it. So he doesn't quite give it to us. Again, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely, freely give us all things for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can you, can, does anyone ever get excited? Hey, I have a gift for you. Like, really? Oh, then, oh, a gift. Oh, for me? Yes, for you. The greatest gift that was ever given was the Son of God. He gave his son as a gift to us that, so that we might have eternal life. Our confidence in our relational standing with our Heavenly Father is small if we think he doesn't want to give to us. He does want to give to us. He says, I am your father. And my heart is toward my children. You don't believe me? Look at the lilies of the field. Do you not see how I take care of them? You don't see them getting in their cars or getting on the subways to go to work. But I take care of them. No one's clothed more beautifully. No one's more radiant. No one is dressed better than these lilies that are in the field. Not even Solomon and his kingdom and all his glory were arrayed more beautifully than the lilies that just grow and they sway in the wind, those beautiful flowers. Do you not see the grass? Same thing. The grass, they get cut and they get thrown in the oven like they're nothing. And yet, that little nothing, the grass, is so important to me. I beautify the fields with them. And if I care about the grass, which is today and tomorrow is cast in the oven, what do you think? I think about you who's created in my image. What do you think God is thinking when he looks at you? You are much more to him than those flowers in the field. You're much more to him than the grass which is today and tomorrow is gone. You're much more than, to him than the sparrows that fly in the air. You are of more value than many, many sparrows. And even Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? but lose his own soul. So there's the economy. We have it right there. God looks at this whole planet Earth. He looks at all the great and mighty mountains. He looks at all the oceans of the world, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean. He looks at everything, all the great plains and all the land masses of this beautiful planet. And he says, one soul is more valuable than to me than all the real estate of the planet Earth. Why? Why do we think God does not want to give to us? He gave to us his son. Now, is your faith small because you strive with God? Maybe God speaks to you and you don't listen, and so you don't expect God to do for you because you know you're living disobedient to him. Why should God bless you? 
if you're so busy not doing what he says? Or could it be that you just don't know? I don't know your heart. I don't know where you are with the Lord. But I will tell you this, that it would just be who you so it would suit you so well to just surrender your will to God. Live for the Lord with the knowledge to know that God loves you and he takes care of you and will take care of you. I like to put it like this. I think you have daddy issues. Daddy issues You're with your father in heaven. You know, I meet people with these quote unquote daddy issues. All right. Listen, don't you be a Christian with daddy issues with your heavenly father. Listen to me. He is without sin. He's perfect on all his ways. So if there's a problem, we have to look at you. Don't be one with daddy issues. There was no one in the Bible with more daddy issues than the prodigal son. The prodigal son, one day, it, this is a parable that Jesus told. There were two sons in a household, and the younger son, he's a grown-up, and he tells his daddy, who's rich, he's a, a wealthy uh, landowner, and says to him, listen, I have an inheritance with you. I want to, give me my inheritance. You know you don't want me in this house anymore. Uh, and you know what? I'm tired of living here and living under your rules. Give me my inheritance. Give me my portion and I'll be out of your way and you'll certainly be out of mine. And the heartbroken father gives his son this money, this inheritance. This son has been disrespectful. How can you tell your dad that? Hey, I can't wait for you to die. Give me the money now so I can leave and be out of your way. Because if the dad dies, then he leaves everything to the children. I can't wait that long. Just give me the money now, and I'll get out of your way, and you'll be out of mine. And so the heartbroken father gives his son the money. And the Bible says, uh, in the parable that Jesus tells, the son goes off to a far country. And you know what he does with this money? He doesn't invest it in the New York Stock Exchange. He doesn't go out and buy a business. He goes and he parties. The Bible says that he wastes this money on riotous living. He goes and he drinks and he parties. It's women. It's, it's rubbery. He does some bad things with this money. And the Bible says that a mighty famine arose in the land and he wasted all the money and he was in trouble. He had nowhere to live. He had no money, nothing to fall back on and no friends. He had a bunch of friends when he was partying and now they are gone because his money is gone. Listen to me. Uh, we get friends if we have money and when the money's gone, they're gone. And so this young man was in trouble. And the Bible says that he got a job. Lucky him. He found a job, but he found a bad job. He found a job feeding the pigs. The Bible says he fed these pigs with these husks, these uh, just this uh, not very appealing things. And he had to go in the pig pen and get dirty right, and get close to those smelly pigs. And he got so bad and he was so hungry that he looked at the pig's food and that food started to look good to him. And then he woke up. Said, what am I doing here? How did I end up here? Why? And he started to remember, I disrespected my dad. Even the people that work for my father live better than this. They live better than this. They don't eat pig food. They eat well. And, they... and so he has this idea. You know what? I messed up. But I'm going to go back to my dad. And I'm going to apologize. I'm going to apologize and tell him I'm sorry. And I'm going to ask him to give me a job. I got this bad job here. He'll never. My father will never take me back as his son. But maybe he'll let me work for him. That's what he figured. And it says here in Luke chapter 15. That now he really disrespected his father really bad. So he knows his father. Or at least he believes his father wants no part of him. So he goes and he thinks, all right, I need to have a killer apology. The kind of apology that will get me back into this house somehow. So he works on it. He doesn't want to mess it up, he says. And so it says here that he practices his speech that he's going to give his father. He practices and it says here in uh, verse number 18, he, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him. He's planning it out. He's planned it out. I'll say to him, 
I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. That's his killer apology speech. Hopefully that gets him in the house and at least he can eat real food. And so he takes the long trip. He's out of money, so he's not riding a horse or a donkey. He's got to walk. He doesn't have shoes, the Bible says. He's walking barefoot. He has gone as low as you can go. By the way, if you, as a young person, think that your parents are old and don't understand life, and you think that uh, you've got everything figured out, and it's your parents that are out of touch and they don't understand, listen to me, I'm going to tell you right now, you are dreaming and you need to learn to listen to your parents. But that is not what I'm talking about today. But you need that. So, he takes the long walk. When you take that long walk, you have a lot of time to think. You have the opportunity to remember every time you didn't listen. Look up here, pay attention. You have a lot of time to think. Yes, and he practices his speech. I have sinned against thee. I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called. Thy son make me as one of thy hired servants. And he's want to make sure he gets every line of that little speech right. Because if he messes up this speech, his father's not going to forgive him, not going to let him work for him. And he's going to be out in the cold and he has nothing to eat. And the Bible says here in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What happened to the speech? <laughs> what happened to the speech? Verse 21. Here it comes, the speech. Here it comes. Here it comes. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. There's the speech. He got it out. He got every line right. His father didn't hear a word he said. In verse 22, but the father said unto his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. His father did not hear the speech, but his father ran to him and embraced him and hugged him. And then he tried to get his speech out. Listen to me. You know why some of you think that God doesn't want to answer your prayer? I'll tell you why. Because you know right from wrong, and you do wrong just too many times, and you do not expect your father to have an open heart toward you. But you're wrong. You're wrong. Listen to me. First of all, we need to get our act together and stop playing church and stop, stop trying to do things our own way. Playing church doing things our own way. We've got young people, you got these weird relationships, girls with these boys and so on, guys and girls, you're doing things behind the scenes. We got other Christians, we got other people, hold on now, hold on now, we've got other Christians. You're looking at things on the internet and you think God does not see or you think you're gonna get by with it somehow. Listen, this is serious. And then it's time to pray. And then when you start to pray, you start to remember all those things that you're doing. And then you realize God doesn't want to hear my prayer because you remember how you're living. I just want you to know that God knows what you're doing. Listen, listen. All the sound carries in this room. So when I, I hear you, it kind of distracts me a bit. Listen. God knows what you're doing. And he still loves you. He still loves you. So here's my advice. 
Run back to God. Stop sinning. Fix your relationship with your father. The problem is you. God never stopped loving you. The prodigal son left and disrespected the father. Disrespected his father. He knows what he did. So when it's time to go back, all the flashbacks of how vile he was to his dad, all the ingratitude he had, remembered it all, and he realized, my father must hate me by now after the way I treated him. But our God in heaven is so good and so gracious that if we would confess our sins, as many as our sins are, as many as dark as our sins are, he will still forgive us and receive us to himself. And if you would pray to him, not with vain repetition, but prayers that are the type of prayers that God wants to hear, he would hear us. Some of our praying is, is done in fear of God because we feel like I've disappointed God. But listen to me, we need to fix our relationship with the Lord, confess our sin, and come back to him. We need to remember that God is the one who made the first move when he sent his son Jesus. He loves us. Before we ever knew him, he loved us. Remember, he gave up his only son for you and for me. This heavenly father of ours is like no other. And again, what are the vain repetitions? All those things that God's already got for us. He knows that we have need of them before we ask him. So when we pray, we need to learn what are we supposed to seek? What are we supposed to be praying for? What, are we, what is this now? Here it is, verse 32. It says here, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Let me put it to you just like this. Instead of praying for things that God has already given you. Why don't you pray for power instead? Instead of praying for things that God is already going to give to you, why don't you pray that God's kingdom would prosper? It says here, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We pray vain repetitions. What are the vain repetitions? The vain repetitions are really things that God has already, already has covered. God wants to see you now get on payroll with his kingdom. God will answer our prayers according to our measure of faith. And so as we are living contrary to his will, so does our faith meter draw small. And we start to worry that God will even answer our smallest prayers. But we need to remember that he loves us and we need to respond to his love by doing his will and showing that we love him by heeding and hearkening and listening to what he says. The Lord would rather us, instead of seeking small things like food and clothing and personal needs that he will already provide for, we need to seek his kingdom. The Lord would rather us pray after this manner. What is that manner? It says here in the scripture, in, in uh, chapter 6, it says in verse 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Instead of worrying about whether you eat food or drink water, Let's worry about the name of God that it would be uplifted. Who prays that prayer with passion? 
Hallowed be thy name, Lord God. May no one take the name of the Lord in vain. But we pray for other things. Lord. And, and then it says, what, what comes in verse 10? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So before you start asking for things for yourself, I'm praying that the kingdom of God would prosper. I'm praying that God would prosper his church. I'm praying that souls will be saved. I'm praying that the word of God would go out. I'm praying that the work of God would prosper and grow. And this is what we should pray for first. But seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to pray for righteousness. If I'm going to pray for righteousness, I might as well live right. I'm not going to fool God, am I? By God, send your righteousness, but I'm going to live unrighteous and do whatever I want. No, that doesn't work, does it? So if I'm going to pray for righteousness, I need to choose to live right myself. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I always bring it back to tithing. I always seem to find a way to bring it to giving, but I've got to use this as an example. The tithing record seems to reflect this. As people receive, people work jobs, and they get money, and you're supposed to give 10%. You're supposed to give 10% out of the gross of your income. Right? Uh, oh, we're supposed to give a tenth of all the increase. And yet, people don't do that. That is investing in the kingdom of God. And investing in righteousness so that God's work could prosper. So as we pray, but we don't obey God in this area, what's happening here? So if I say the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, but I'm not doing God's will. I'm watching things on television I shouldn't be watching. I talk in vulgar and obscene ways that a Christian should not be heard speaking in. Thinking that, well, the pastor's not around. He doesn't hear. But God's there. He hears it. He knows. And yes, he still loves you. But listen, here's where it catches up with you. You ready? It's when you close your eyes and pray. And you start praying. And then you start to remember all the stuff you did. And then you're like, well, God doesn't want to hear from me. It's not that God doesn't want to hear from you. It's that you've, you've drawn your faith so small because you don't listen to God. So we need to start listening to God. Seek his kingdom. Daddy issues. That's what that looks like to me, my friend. We're almost done. Pray for, invest in, and seek the kingdom of God. That God's kingdom will prosper. And as you seek the welfare of God's church, and you seek the welfare of the gospel that people would hear, understand that as you make the preaching of the gospel your first priority in life, God will then take care of your business. He takes care of your needs without you asking. Because your asking is really just vain repetitions of people who don't have faith in God and don't have faith in God's providence. God's already going to take care of you because you're his child. So now you need to get on board and serve him. I hope you understand that your primary role in life is as a Christian and as a part of the body of Christ. You may have a job somewhere where you are a doctor, a businessman, a lawyer, an engineer, a sanitation worker, uh, a dog catcher. Whatever you do in life to make a living, that's not who you are. You are first a Christian, and then you are how you make a living. And listen to me, as a dog catcher, a Christian dog catcher, your primary passion should be the kingdom of God. Amen. You are a student here, and you will pray, oh God, help me with these exams. Oh God, help me to get accepted into college. Oh God, help me to get a job one day or career. But understand that as a student, you are not a student first. You are a Christian first, a Christian student. And so in your pursuit, and what you want in life, 
May your first pursuit and your first love be the kingdom of God and the work of God. You take the kingdom of God with you and you bring your classmates. You bring them to church. You bring the gospel with you and you bring it to them. You might not be able to get them into the doors of the church, but you take the church and you give it to them. And you tell them God loves you and you share your faith. That's what it means to put the kingdom of God first. We're going to have the invitation at this time. And in a message like this, the preacher does not know what is happening here. This thing is between you and your father, your heavenly father. And as the Lord has spoken to your heart, I advise that you hear him and commune with your father in heaven. To, just to be clear, let me have everyone to stand at this time. Let's all stand. The invitation has begun. The altar is open for you to pray, do business with the Lord. I encourage you to take this time now to pray. There's a temptation to relax and to converse. Let us pray. Let us pray to our Father in heaven.